Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to welcome you all here to the Center for Mind and Brain for this Summit on Mindfulness. When Cliff and I first started talking about what was going to happen at this summit, my view of it, my image of it was we would have a bunch of experts on Eastern contemplative practices talking about how great mindfulness is and how it would you know, lift everybody up. And if we could just get everybody into these practices and increase mindfulness, it would be great for everybody. And then we'd have a bunch of scientists talking about how they're doing research, trying to figure out, well, what's the, what are the best practices that give us the best change in different outcome measures? And Cliff said, no, I want to do the opposite. <laughs> I want to question whether it even makes sense and how it makes sense and what, what are we are doing when we're doing scientific research on something that is a social, cultural, religious practice and what it means to actually try to isolate the active ingredient and that sort of thing. So here's, a, here's an analogy that I thought of while I was riding my bike in this morning. So for thousands of years, the indigenous people who live in the Andes region of South America have chewed coca leaves. And coca leaves are very complex. They have lots of different uh, elements in them. They've got vitamins, minerals, a lot of calcium, cocaine, other psychostimulants. And for thousands of years, chewing these leaves has been a part of their social, cultural, and religious practices. <coughs> And it's an important part of those practices and with no obvious negatives, only positives. But of course, the Europeans came along and they got focused on the psychostimulant aspects of it. They isolated cocaine. And well, you know how the rest of the story goes. So I think it's important to think about what we are doing when we are doing research on meditation, contemplative practices in general, mindfulness, and to try to think about it so that we don't take the one thing out of it that's going to make things worse instead of making things better. So I'm really excited to hear all the perspectives of the really broad array of people that Cliff has brought here this morning. And I'm looking forward to an exciting day of self-reflection that hopefully will lead to some good. And that's what we try to achieve with these yearly summits at the CMB, bringing together top people from around the world to try to make progress on an important issue. So I'm looking forward to it, and I thank you all for coming, and enjoy the day. Thank you, Steve. That was a beautiful introduction to the scope of the day. And I'm really humbled and honored and thrilled that we actually have an audience from which we could have created a, a dozen different conferences. Today really is a day in a common living room. And since each and every one of you in this room is a stakeholder in some level in this enterprise, we really want to sort of minimize the distinction between who's in the front of the room and who's not in the front of the room. That having been said, there are going to be some really remarkable people in the front of the room. So for just a few minutes, I want to set a stage. We have a reality over the last several years of an explosion of published work on mindfulness. This was a graph by uh, David Black of the Mindfulness Research. Uh, he has a website that um, every year he adds another column to this exponential rise. And I've put in the 2014. And if we look at the rate of publications for 2015, it's continuing to accelerate. So this is the published scientific literature. And the, some of the consequences are that we have in the popular press a view of mindfulness and meditation that is almost panacea-like. This you might have recognized from last year in the Huffington Post, and Ariana Huffington says, the list of all the conditions that these practices impact for the better, depression, anxiety, heart disease, memory, aging, creativity, sounds like a label on snake oil from the 19th century, except this cure-all is real, and there are no toxic side effects. We'll hear more about that later. <laughs> and we have 
some influential popular books. Dan Harris's book is really very entertaining, but when you get to the science, it's so hyperbolic and overblown, kind of made um, me not 10% happier. <laughs> We've seen in November the cover of Scientific American, an article written by our friends Mathieu, Antoine Lutz, Mathieu Ricard, Antoine Lutz, Richie Davidson. Some images from this article will appear momentarily. And just earlier last month, the most impactful journal in neuroscience, Nature Reviews Neuroscience, impact factor of 31 for those of you who that makes sense to, an article, The Neuroscience of Mindfulness Meditation. Admittedly, listing a number of caveats, but also not really going into depth of the nature of contemplative practice. And then we have this. <laughs> so the reporter, I'm in this article, so is Willoughby. The reporter got to us because our data from the Shamatha Project for improving visual perception is being used by Wall Street brokers to motivate their meditating to be able to see more sharply so they can make faster trades. It's a kind of internal high frequency trading. They call it brain hacking. And then we have the best dressed monk, clothes for the mindful man. This is not a spoof. So of course, what is there going to be with this? A backlash. So this is only from last week, separating the hype from the science, in the Minneapolis Post. And here is the um, author list and title of an article that is in preparation, five authors of which are in the room, trying to begin to redress to an academic audience some of the complex issues for what we can agree on and what really remain open questions. That having been said, we're going to begin with a formal opening this morning. And we are gifted with the presence of my much better half, Barbara Bogatin, cellist in the San Francisco Symphony who's going to lead us in an embodied contemplative experience, playing some solo cello. And at the end, well, you will say what we're going to do. Barbara. Thank you. Why did you get on? I'll hold it. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today in my capacity as the official cellist of the neuroscience community. <laughs> But before I play, I need to make a special introduction to my life partner, my cello. <laughs> this is Giovanni. And Giovanni is named after his maker, who was Giovanni Battista Gabrielli. And uh, Gabrielli created this magnificent piece of wood in Florence, Italy in 1752. Uh, I was lucky enough to find Giovanni in a musical instrument dealer's shop in 1986. So we have been together for a long time now. And like most musicians and their instruments, we have a very close relationship. Um, it was just a couple of decades before Giovanni was created that the composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, created six monumental works for solo cello, which he called suites. And this was really the first time in the history of music that any composer had thought to write music of such complexity and expressive richness for a cello all by itself. So really, Bach was introducing his listeners to the sound world of the cello in these pieces. And I'm going to play the first movement, the prelude, from the first suite that Bach wrote. Um, I think it's fitting to start this day with music, because for me, the practice of music and the practice of meditation have always been two sides of the same coin. When I perform, I need to cultivate a variety of qualities of mind, including a very focused attention. 
and an ongoing awareness of the music as it unfolds so that I can implement the notes that Bach wrote. And in addition, I have to find a uh, great deal of conscious intention in order to bring out and communicate the meaning and the emotion that lies underneath the notes. So today, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to ask a favor, which is after I finish playing, please do not applaud, even if you like it. Uh, instead, as you listen to the last resonance of the cello fade into silence, let's sit together for a few minutes of silent meditation. So with that in mind, uh, make sure you're seated in a comfortable position. Turn all of your electronic devices onto the please do not disturb mode. And welcome to the sound world of box prelude in G major. Thank mm -hmm. you. 